most of my lessons I learned the hard way. I learn everything the hard way. You know, uh, it's it's just it's just who I am, I suppose. But the my, my job, my my undercover role, this persona that I inherited, it got dangerous because it ultimately it stopped being what I did for a living and it became who I was. Um, and, and, and that line got very blurry for me. Um, and, and, and that was dangerous. I put a huge amount of battle damage on my family, on the people that, that, that I loved because I was so, uh, entrenched in, in my, in my career. I, I like, I, I, I was selfish. I made selfish decisions. I made decisions about me, for me, that were good for me, that were good for my career, at least what I believed were good. And I didn't consider all the other people in my life and how those decisions were going to impact them. Um, in hindsight, in reflection, now having stepped away from that world, um, the people that loved me the most are the ones I treated the worst. I took them for granted because I felt like they're always going to be here. Um, and, and I, and I, you know, I, I, I hurt, I, I was not a good husband. I was not a good father. Um, and those are the regrets and, and the shame and, and probably at times the humiliations that, that I, that I carry with me now. That, that I'm trying to fix, I'm trying to repair, which, which the God element comes back in because through the, through forgiveness, you know, like, like I get a second chance. I, I, I get another opportunity through that faith to try to be better. Well, your kids are probably full grown now. I mean, remember at one time on um, the street, your daughter was 12 and uh, you had encountered one of the members and um, she went around went with the role playing and uh, you thanked her for that, for not telling her mom as well. Um, she didn't tell her mom. But where are your kids now? If you can talk about it. if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. But where are your kids now? Are they adults? Um, and are you able to kind of find that common ground and understanding that they understand that you were in a very dangerous role? Yeah. My, you know, my kids are adults now. And, and I'll tell you the the, the 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 nicest, most flattering statement that I can hear or that really any of us, in, in my opinion, can hear is when someone says, hey, man, your kids are good kids. Your kids are, are pleasant kids and they're, 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 they're good kids to be around. That, I, I, that was my job. My job wasn't to be Donnie Brasco part two. Mm -hmm. My job wasn't to infiltrate the Hells Angels. My job was to raise good kids. And as parents, when, when we hear flattering statements about our, our children, that, that's, that, that's like one of the highest compliments you can receive. Yeah. You, you, you know, but you have a persona, right? And uh, you, you have to kind of, I wouldn't even say bifurcate your, your persona from this to that. Um, you know, it's a switch, you know, it's a dimmer almost in a sense. I, I think, um, when you are meeting people, you have this, these concentric rings, your familiars, your friends, and your family. And the deeper you go into those rings, you know, that's the, the real person. I mean, I do it at work. You meet people. Hello. How are you? You move on. Now, you don't get into every, you know, part of your personality. You have to have a wall. You can't just let intimacy happen. You can't have everybody know everything about you. But you're meeting these guys, the HAs, or any bikers. And it seems to me they know who they are, right? There is, you, or is there a persona there? Is that a fake persona? Are these guys real, true mavericks in the sense that they buck the idea of fitting in that cog in the machine of everybody else? It's us going to work. These guys, they have a mission. They know what they do. And they're really, a re that's who they are. And they have accepted that they're going to do some bad stuff. Yeah, uh, that, that's very accurate. And and not just in the in the biker world, in, in that criminal community. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, like, like for me and the way you characterized the, the question earlier, um, there, there's an event I'd been gone for an extended period of time working on the streets and I came home and my wife was, my, my wife told me, you cannot walk in this house 
and speak to me and the and our kids like we're street gangsters. And then so in my self-defense, I was like, man, I'm not a light switch. I can't <laughs> turn this on and off. Yeah. Like, what I do for a living, I have yeah. to be on all the time. And then her response was, when you come to this house, you better install a dimmer switch and dial that attitude down. And if you can't do that, don't come back here. That's, I mean, that, that, that's a harsh, uh, a harsh reality, uh, being presented to you from someone that you love and someone that you know, loves you. I think it's a very strong woman to be able to say that and say, she's not going to put up with that. I think in a lot of times we see in these movies like Donnie Brasco or anything else where the woman is just along for the ride and there is no input and she doesn't have this you know, line of demarcation. She says, no, I'm not putting up with it. So we, we get the sense that uh, the wives or the spouses, they're just like, Hey, whatever, you know, let them do what he needs to do. And I'll just support that. But I think that your wife gives you some type of sanity, that moral ground that said, no, this is reality. This is your family. This is the real life over here. You're getting sucked in, I would think. Yeah. You know what? And, and man, regretfully, like I, I learned that the hard way. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I lost uh, the focus of what my priorities needed to be. Yeah. Um, I couldn't, uh, in that period of my life, I would be gone for an extended period of time. And I would come home and I would do the bare minimum that I had to do to keep my family functioning. I would pay the bills, pat the kids on the head, have a cup of coffee with my wife. I couldn't wait to get back out on the street and be smoking and joking with gangsters. That That's, that's where I perceived my value was. That's where, where I perceived my purpose to be. That, that, that wasn't where my value was. That wasn't my purpose. My value was my family and the people that were close to me and that I loved. My purpose was to try to raise good kids, be a good husband, be a good father. And man, like I failed miserably, um, you know, for a long period of time in it, with those things. But where are you at now? I mean, you know, emotionally. Uh, mentally. Uh, I know people who miss their work. Uh, you know, I've got a buddy you've known a long time, homicide detective, you know, misses the work. Uh, he's retired now, but he wants to get back in. Um, for you, do you have those thoughts or are you happy? Are you a guy who goes, you know, fishing, you go ride your Harley, you, you go to, you go and hang out with family. And is there any, you know, desire to get re immersed into something? I we're, 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 might, might even be mall security, but, uh, to stand on the side of law enforcement again. You know what? I'll, I'll tell you what I miss. Um, I, I don't miss the uh, operations. Mm -hmm. I don't miss uh, like living that false persona. I don't. I don't miss that life of deception and and of lies. Um, I miss the people. I miss the people I work with. I miss that sense of like joining together with other people, with, with a common goal, with a common mission and objective, and then working together and working through problems, trying to figure it out and accomplish something good. Um, it, it, and, and I, it, it all comes back, this entire conversation comes back to, it's about relationships. Mm -hmm. Anybody that's, that's done my job for any extended period of time, anybody that's been uh, in the military for any extended period of time. They have dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of hero stories and, and amazing accomplishments and, and, and things that they, that they did that they can be proud of and that people from the outside look at as courageous or heroic. Um, you know, you, 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 you've, you, you do this job long enough, you run out of fingers and toes to count all the times that you should have been killed, that you should be dead. And only by the grace of God, only because God had his hand on your shoulder that day, are you still there? Now, talk to me about brotherhood or teams, the people you work with. I mean, I'm, I'm, I know you led people. Um, what are some of the techniques you use to, you know, gain their trust and the support of your teams? Um, in, in the kind of work you're doing. I'm sure you had to pull a guy aside and say, hey, listen, you, you're losing courage and this is what you need to do. In fact, if I recall, there was a time where you had to, to talk to a guy 
who was probably, you know, very anxious, right? He couldn't do the work anymore. You know what? It, it, it happens. I, I mm -hmm. think it's, it's natural it, it, it be, because, you know, um, like e even if there's just windows of time where your head clears and you're like, man, what am I doing? Like, like, what is this about? And, and, and it causes you to question yourself and, and, and what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, I spent my professional life telling a lie. The, the persona I inherited was a lie. The things I said were lies. They were deceptions. Now that deception, that that's a legally sanctioned technique that law enforcement uses. It, it is really undercover work is really nothing more than a tool in an investigator's toolbox. I was just uh, like one of those tools that, that the people that I worked with used, but like the, the, the thing I missed, the thing that's, um, that, that was the challenge was that for in life, any of us, the people that are the highest achievers, highest achievers are the best problem solvers. Um, and so as a group, as a unit, as a task force, like how do you solve problems? Well, you solve them through communication, open communication with people. And then through that communication, when you're open and transparent and honest, you build trust and you build loyalty. In some cases, you build love. And then when those things come together, you can attack whatever that a problem is and collectively try to solve it. Like, I miss that part of it. Mm -hmm. Do you ever, ever have um, imposter syndrome? Have you ever looked over your shoulder and said, man, who am I, you know? What am I doing? I mean, I've talked to some high achievers and I agree with you. They're great problem solvers, but at the same time, they always feel that they didn't do enough. Whereas a lot of the culture believes that they do, that they do enough uh, and they're satisfied. And that's good. You know, you mop a floor, you know, the floor's mopped and it's pretty darn good. But in the line of work where you're dealing with the human condition and people, uh, people are so diverse. They're so different. Did you ever feel like a fraud or a fake or something? Not only did I feel that way, um, mm -hmm. I, I was the, the, like, like even being um, just transparent about it. That was the nature of my job, the way I did my job. My job was to build a false persona and then encounter uh, people that were committing crimes or at least suspected of committing crimes and sell them my lie. Let's talk about your career going back. I mean, you were playing football and then that didn't come through. And then you went straight into law enforcement. Um, as you got better and better, or deeper or more immersed into this role, right, of undercover work, and the more you made those connections, I mean, you never really left. You didn't go to Maine, you didn't go to Connecticut. I mean, you stayed local, right? Uh, for the most part, for, for the most part, you know, I, um, I, I came on the job in, in Arizona. Um, my, my fourth day at work, I got hired on a Monday. My fourth day at work, I got host, I got taken hostage and was shot. Um, I was shot point blank by a suspect, uh, with a, a 38. Uh, I pushed the gun into my back. Um, the bullet went through my lung. It narrowly missed my heart. It exited my chest, you know, and after four days on the job, I was laying in the dirt and garbage of this trailer park and blood was coming out of my chest. Like you're holding your thumb over the end of a garden hose. Like I was this big pool of blood was growing around me. And I remember this like crinkled up, like thrown away, like potato chip bag like kind of blew through the wind and stuck in this puddle of blood and then blew past me. And I was like, I was dying. And the reality of it is, is that I hadn't even gotten a paycheck yet. <laughs> like we get paid every two weeks. Yeah. Like I was still a week and a half away from getting my first paycheck. Um, 
And then like after the recovery and, and the, you know, and, and being repaired, it didn't discourage me. It, it, it encouraged me. I felt like I was invincible. I felt like I was bulletproof. Um, like, like I, like I led myself to believe I, like I undercovered myself. I deceived myself into thinking, man, I'm the baddest cat on the planet. They just put a bullet through my chest. Here I am. I'm ready to go. I wanted another chance. I wanted a chance to try to do it right. So, I mean, some people that get in and uh, they decide it's not for them. You know, they get in one firefight, whatever, and say, this is it, man. I, you know, I want to live. But for you, what drove you? Is there Was there a weakness in you? Was there, I mean, I know you stated that you felt invincible, but was that something that you were, was that corrective action for some past injuries? Or was that corrective attitude uh, because you perceived that, um, you know, you had to remind yourself that you're not weak, that you're not going to be that guy from the past. And I know people who are, are like that. You know, it's a, it's a front, it's a cover. You know, like I had um, sold myself. Mm-hmm. Know, that I was that I was the baddest cat out there which the reality of it is is that I wasn't um, and, and and I understand that now but but what I but I did know and I and I did believe and I believe now is that I, like I could absorb punishment um, like I'm not like I was never like a great fighter a great uh, uh, marksman uh, mm-hmm. A, like a gunslinger type guy, but I knew I could absorb punishment um, and, and, and keep going and keep moving forward. The whole, the whole Rocky speech about it's not how hard you get punched or how many times you get punched. It's how many times you get punched and can you keep moving forward? I knew I could do that. That's really cool. I mean, you know, I think a lot of it is a protection mechanism, right? And we have to. We should have that. We should believe that we're the baddest dude out there. We don't want to work with guys who are, you know, mentally weak or feel weak and say, I can't do this. I mean, I think you have to go out with a crew and say, you know, these are meat eaters, right? I mean, just like the special forces or something. You are going to go out there and you're going to go kick some ass and you're going to go take some names, right? You're going to do the job. And I think you can reflect 30 years later or 20 years later when you retire and say, well, Maybe that's not true, but at that time, this is what I needed. I needed to have this attitude to get this job done. Well, so, I'll tell you one of the uh, common denominators that I have found over time mm-hmm. between uh, like uh, the operators in the undercover world and uh, like the, the military mindset, the special forces uh, type mentality is that, and, and, and I've worked alongside side by side, shoulder to shoulder with some of the, the best undercover operators ever in history. Like I've, I, I've, I've been allowed and permitted and blessed to, to work alongside some of those guys. Um, they're humble, mm-hmm. they're gracious, um, they're self depreciating at times. They're very quick to flatter their peers and, and speak highly of their peers. But inside, when you get down to it, they all think they're the best. They all believe that they're the best. And you have to have that mindset yeah. to be successful and, and, and to go do dangerous things and, and to put you know fears and trepidation and those things aside and move forward. If you don't think you're the best, then like you're not going to survive in any of those worlds very long. If, if you don't want to be on the point, if you don't want to be the guy that everybody's eyes are on, that everybody's counting on, that everybody's looking to, to come in and save the day, then you know what, then, then there's spots for you to step to the back and let somebody else do that. But all those guys in, 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 in the military world, in the undercover world, um, like our tactical operators, they all believe that they're the best internally. They may not let it out. They may not advertise it. Some advertise it. Some are very quick to tell you that they're the best ever. Um, but most are humble and gracious about it, very quick to credit their peers. But, but in their own minds, they believe, I'm the guy. I'm the one you want. I'm the guy who should be here front and center to accomplish this mission. I agree. I think this person should have that attitude. I just don't see any other way to tackle a problem 
when yeah, you're well, dealing with people who yeah. have an unsavory nature, man, and they don't give a damn. So uh, in those have worlds, to. if you don't feel that way and then you are on the point, you're dangerous. And you're dangerous not only to yourself, to everybody else around you. For you, you've worked with a lot of cool people, a lot of great guys in your uh, you know, area of expertise. Um, who's your hero in life? Was it your father, your mom, you know? My dad, my okay. dad definitely uh, was was my hero. He was the best man that, that I've ever known or ever likely will know. Um, he, like a much better man um, than, than I am, uh, than I, than I became to be. I, I, I wish I could have been as good as him. Um, he did everything within his power to put me in a position to, to be that person. Um, I, I worked alongside, you know, legendary figures in the undercover world. And that there's, that there's a bit of a, like an unofficial fraternity, for lack of better terms, of these operators who've done long-term deep cover infiltrations. You know, everybody's, you know, Joe Pistone, uh, Donnie Brasco, like his face is the first face carved in the granite of the Mount Rushmore of undercover operators, man. Everybody knows Joe. Um, he, he's a very good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 we worked in different eras, so I never worked alongside of him, but those things he did um, and, and many others that followed him, I worked with, you know, the best of the very best uh, of, of modern day undercover work. I, like I was never the best. I, I never, I never portrayed myself to be the best. Um, I, I know what a hero looks like. I've, I've worked and rubbed shoulders with heroes. I'm not a hero, man. I got too many things wrong and made too many mistakes to be a hero. So let's talk about that. I mean, uh, you know, any lesson learned today that you wish you had known during your career? I mean, that one thing that you really wished. And for some people, it's they, they realize that uh, they didn't know how to regulate their emotions, man. They put up such a wall between them and their family and everybody else, and they had to for survival. Uh, but a regret that you had there, you didn't know how to speak to your children. What, what, what is the biggest lesson learned? And it might not even be a regret. Um, it, it, well, the lesson learned, it, you know, is actually a regret. It's that, um, um, I, like I, I, I had some, some great successes professionally. Those, I allowed those successes to, um, probably develop some arrogance about like, that, that whole mindset of selling yourself that you're the best. I had some arrogance about that, uh, an ego about that. Um, I, I made selfish decisions that, that hurt people around me. Um, n n only after I was, a after I stepped out of that world and, and I, and I didn't, I didn't step out of it. I was forced out of it. The people that supervised me and managed me basically said, you don't get to do this anymore. And I was like, man, how can you take this away from me? Like, I'm, I'm great at this. I love this. I want to do this. I want to serve. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I want to serve you. I want to help you be great. Let me do what I do. Um, when, when that was pulled away from me, man, I hung on to it. I put my claws into it. I did not want to leave that world. But the people that were around me knew better than I did. Um, that was probably the greatest gift they gave me was saying like, man, you need to pump your brakes, dude. Uh, Cause like you, you're going to, you're going to crash. Let's talk about goal setting then. I mean, you know, you talk about Westmoreland, Vietnam. They said, you know, you've got to get X, Y, Z bodies. This is, uh, you know, this is the body count. These are our stats. This is what we bring to the leadership. But for you, um, did you have a goal every day? You know, you see in these movies where the cop says, yeah, we got them. And their whole, uh, desire for that movie is to get the bad guy but for you did you operate like that where you had to have goals these milestones or did you just operate and say hey um you know you're just not drifting but you're not so focused on taking down two or three or ten guys it's just you're just existing and doing your job yeah i, I personally never had that um 
objective like that was focused on an individual like mm -hmm. i've got to get this guy um my, my objective was was to and i think i said this earlier was to get that information that intelligence that evidence of a crime a crime event um you know, was I investigating a murder? Was I investigating gun running or drug dealing or whatever? The, uh, the, the, the scheme that we were trying to infiltrate was m my goal was to get as much of that information as I could. And then, then I delivered that out. I delivered that to a case agent. And like I said, to, to prosecutors who would ultimately present it in a legal fashion. Um, but, but I, like, I never um, said, I'm going to get this guy. I'm going to make sure this guy gets locked up for the rest of his life. That was never my objective. It was, it was never that intimately personal for me. Let's talk about trauma then. You know, I had uh, Chris Pronto, Benghazi on, and uh, he had disclosed that, uh, you know, he went in the shower and he's going to put a gun in his mouth and blow his brains out. You know, there's just trauma because you realize I live, they died. They're not coming back. And that really hits home for a lot of people. For you, um, it may not be PTS. It might be something else. But is there trauma? Is there something that you need to, to work on, some type of personal struggle? And and if you have had one, uh, how would you deal with it? Or are you dealing with it now, like therapy, counseling, or speaking in public, for example? Well, I think even like like having a conversation like ours is therapeutic. Okay. Um, I, I could not have had this conversation um, years ago because I, I uh, wasn't honest enough with myself to, uh, to be vulnerable about it. Um, it, like it but, but you can't, you know, when you're in that world, when you're operating, you, you can't let your guard down. Um, man, the second you let your guard down, man, someone's gonna hit you on the back of the head with a baseball bat. You have to be on the point all the time. Definitely agree with you. Yeah, so, you know, it's just kind of fascinating to me that that I agree with you. you know, this is therapeutic. It, it's helpful. It's useful. Um, but you're now teaching people your tradecraft, right? You're going out and speaking engagements, right? You're doing a lot of these conferences, I suppose, and helping others navigate I do like, like, like my message is not so much focused on trade craft. Okay. Um, my, my message is focused on, you know, some of these elements that we've discussed earlier on, uh, on leadership, on, um, uh, mental survival on, on, um, uh, like, uh, like, like I view myself, my success in this, not analytically in, what cases or, or how many seizures or indictments or people went to prison. I don't view that. I, I, I view like success uh, personally, like just in having survived it all. So your relationship with your wife, if you can talk about that, um, you know, you, you talk to a lot of guys who go in your line of work, military careers, et cetera. And they talk about the restoration of marriage. Uh, the reclamation of, you know, um, these vows that they gave, that they're standing by those vows again, you know, for richer or poor, you know, sickness and health, you know, death to his part, that kind of thing. Um, where are you at now? Are you doing things differently that you never thought you would have done? I mean, because you ignored that for a long time because you had to. You weren't present in the home. You were giving money so they could survive. But at the end of the day, that's just what, what guys seem to think that as providers, they're, they're doing enough. I, I'm uh, paying attention to what I should have been paying attention to that I neglected. My, my wife is, is way better than, than I deserve. Uh, she's actually way tougher than I am. She's smarter than I am. Um, I, I've made uh, a million mistakes in my life. I've made a million mistakes with my wife and between God and, and my wife and my kids and my friends, they've given me a million and one second chances uh, to try to get it right. Um, you know, like, like when we can learn forgiveness and when we receive forgiveness, uh, 
you know, fr- from God on down, mm-hmm. that's second chance, man. Like, hold on to it. Like, you know, try to have that wisdom, like I said, that I didn't have earlier. Um, and, and, and with that second chance, be better, do better, um, learn from our mistakes. Um, for me, like, like I've got to make the same mistake 10 times before I ultimately learn from it, but then hopefully like hope at some point learn from it. Let's go ahead and talk about your career if we can and talk about how you basically were hung out to dry, right? And the judge sided with you and felt that you didn't get the support that you needed. And now you're able to reflect on it years later as you're able to write a book about it. Uh, well, you wrote the book and they knew it was coming, but you wrote the book. You, your story's been told. You've been on YouTube. You've been out in the social media world talking about it. But um, your leadership didn't support you. And that's a problem. But on reflection... Um, who did you, who did you go to, man, when you were stuck? I mean, did you have a friend or a buddy or a dad or someone around to say, you know, a, a, a couple elements to that. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the betrayal that I received, like was not universal across my agency. Um, it, it was, it, it was not the ATF that, that, that I grew to love and served. It was a perfect storm of corruption. I ran across some some criminals who were supervising me. Um, so um, I started receiving death and violence threats. And, and not just me, like my wife and my kids were too. Um, and, and the people that I needed to engage on those threats turned their back on me. When, it, when, when the threats came home, when the violence and the danger came home, uh, they wanted no part of it and they turned their back on me. Um, they ultimately doubled down on me and exposed my, my backstopping. They unmasked all my backstopping. So all, all the things that were used to disguise uh, my true identity, my true location, my vehicles, all those things, they forced those uh, into uh, the public venue and in the, uh, it, to, 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 to make, to, to show me that they were in charge. Um, a couple months after that happened, my house was burned to the ground by arsonists. Um, and then like, I actually felt relief from that. Like even in the, the my house smoldering, I, I felt like now you can't ignore this. You can't ignore these death and violence threats. Um, and they doubled down again and they built a task force where they tried to frame me as the arsonist of my own house. And, and thus, someone who was willing to murder his own wife and his kids and his family with a fire. Um, and, and, and that's ultimately what led to the lawsuit. And then all these other elements were presented during the trial, which were all proven to be true. So with all those things said, and over time, um, like I am not bitter about that. I'm not angry about it. I'm not resentful. Um, I want forgiveness. I have to give forgiveness to those people that intended harm or me and my family. People make mistakes. They do things wrong. They make bad decisions. But what I learned is that going into those events, I believed that I had hundreds and hundreds of friends. The reality of it is is that I learned that I had hundreds and hundreds of acquaintances. I had a handful of friends. I had a handful of people that no matter what, no matter what was going on, no matter what was being said about me, stood by my side and and did their best to defend me. Those were the friends. I think when things break really bad for you, you, you truly find out. Yeah. You know, and, and th- there was a point in time where I felt like God had lost my phone number. I'm like, man, like this, like this dude, like God has forgotten about me, that that was not true, but I had to go through some of those things to understand it. You know, like I, so, so going back to the way I was treated by this little pocket of corrupt supervisors at Mm -hmm. ATF, and again, not the entire agency, a handful of people, um, I had spent my life 
befriending people and then betraying that friendship and that loyalty as an undercover operator. When I was betrayed and when those things happened to me, man, I didn't like it very much. Yeah. I was like, man, like, and it kind of opened my eyes. Like, man, you've been doing this to people your entire life and now it happened to you and it sucks. And it, it caused me to question everything I stood for, everything I believed I stood for. It caused me to say like, man, like, did you do it right? Is this what you were supposed to do? Because when it happened to you, you didn't like it very much. Yeah, that's a hard pill to swallow. It's a very difficult one. You know, betrayal sucks. Uh, and of course, to find out that um, that you probably don't have as many friends as you thought. I, I'm okay to have just a handful, but some people feel like, you know, I, th I thought I knew these people and, I, and they didn't. But, you know, you're at a place where you can forgive. And forgiveness is good because it frees you, right? You forgive other people. Uh because you you want to have peace in your heart. And if you don't, you're just going to be an angry, embittered person. But separate from that, has there has to be accountability. Where Was the ATF, this leadership, held accountable? Did you know the names? And uh, because someone else can get injured, someone else can die because of their shoddy work, because of their duplicity. Well, you know, the, the, the names were named. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and the people that, uh, that had bad actions in this... Um, there was no mystery to them, but um, as as we find out over and over again, um, the, the 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 highest levels uh, of government or of organizations, man, like how often do they ever get held accountable? Um, the the truths were exposed. What happened was exposed, but there 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 was no. Uh, like all those people found soft landings. They all had built themselves a safety net. And so, no, there, 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 there really wasn't uh, accountability for it okay. on an individual level, um, which I was frustrated by at the time. I'm, I'm not anymore. Yeah. What, what I'm hoping for is those people that made bad decisions and that, and that did things wrong with, with how they handled my situation. Really what I hope for is that they learned from this, uh, from this situation, like I have that, that they, that they now are, are better and that they wouldn't do those things again, given the same set of circumstances. I'm hoping that that's what was accomplished. Right. But for yourself as well. I mean, I, I think you have to ask yourself, I mean, if, if the shoe is on the other foot, I mean, in your line of work, you're often asked to make intelligent, you know, decisions. And that's going to affect your life and the lives of other people. So were you ever in that situation, a dangerous situation, where you had to make a decision that could have affected you know, other people or yourself? And, and what kind of advice would you, you know, give in the field? Or do you give advice when you're giving these uh, speeches to people? What, what, what is that one thing that keeps you level-headed that, that says, I'm not going to cross over, man. You know, I could do it this way. I could take a shortcut but maybe someone's going to die. Maybe someone's going to get injured. I mean, have you ever been in that position? So the question is really, what advice do you give to people to say sober-minded, even when it seems that you need to be more emotional and just go on a hunch or on, on the intuition? Well, you know, in the business I was in, um, like I never picked and choose. So um, let, let's say that, that I'm investigating Suspect X, we'll just use like some, some generic person who's doing terrible things. If I find out that there's a plot to murder that person, like I would dive into that investigation and do my best to, to solve it um, with, with, you don't get to say, okay, this is person X and they're a bad person. So I'm just going to ignore this and let this happen. Um, that, that it wouldn't have gone down that way. But I think that, you know, for, for young agents, for young officers, uh, just for young people in general, um, if you want something that you never had, you have to do things you've never done to get it. If, if you want people to 
remember your name, you have to give them something they can never forget. And so like if you can have that mentality moving forward, which like I'm going to make my mark, I'm going to put my dent in the universe. Uh, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be remembered. I'm going to try to accomplish things that haven't been accomplished before, but there's, there's a sacrifice in the process. Right. It's going to get handed to you. The world isn't fair. It's not going to treat you fair. Um, you know, uh, the, the life is 10% of what happens to us and 90% of what we choose to do about that. You know, we talk about the hero myth, right? Uh, Joseph Campbell, this idea like Luke Skywalker loses a, a hand or something or, you know, someone goes to war and get their legs blown off and or leg blown off and they come back fighting. So there's a wound. And then um, a lot of the wound is uh, is actually getting back into work, man, like you did when you got shot. You know, it's not just saying ah, I quit or it's post career when you're dealing with that wound. Uh, never really healed. You're suppressing it, the trauma. And then you say, well, this is what I'm left with. And, and as you said, it's 90 percent of, um, you know, perspective. Uh, it's 10 percent of circumstance. Uh, that's just life happens. Let's talk about. Um, well, you know, Mike, I think that like like for our individual problems, mm -hmm. everybody's dealing with something. Right. Um, yeah. Everybody is. Um, most of the world like doesn't have the the compassion or the empathy or the uh, uh, emotional capacity to really get into your problems or my problems because they're dealing with their own um yeah th there's yeah. there's people that that feel bad probably most people don't want to see other people struggle um there's also a handful of people out there that are happy that you have your problems they're, they're happy to see you struggle yeah. and, and and be in a bad spot they they find pleasure in that whether it makes them feel better about their own life or whatever that might be um and 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 like like how do you how do you coach someone through that i i don't know that you do you know it's 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 interesting i mean I, you know even after you've left a career, I mean, you, you, you're still going to have problems, man. You still got to pay the growth for the groceries. You know, you got tax, you got inflation, you got all this stuff. You, you know, you have a life to live, right? The car breaks down, you know, maybe uh, the house needs to be fixed up a little bit. And I guess that's a metaphor for life, but let's start back at the beginning with people. I mean, what makes a person want to join a gang of at this level? You know, most people are just content to work at Starbucks or wherever the job is as an engineer or a mathematician, as a teacher. And you've met a lot of interesting cats, I'm sure. But what makes people want to go into this kind of profession? I, I think that there's uh, some universal elements to that. Okay. Uh, whether it be uh, law enforcement, whether it be the military, like you mentioned, uh, uh, teachers, the teaching profession, um, they, they have a heart for service. They have a heart to, to, uh, to, to, to do something to help other people. Um, I know this, you don't have to have a gun on your hip to change the world and to impact people's lives. You don't have to do that. Um, the, 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 the teachers of the world out, uh, out there, um, are some of the biggest heroes that we have. Yeah. And they're, they're impacting people's lives. And, you know, so like, like people in the, in the teaching profession, we, we, we put our kids with them. They spend more time with our kids than we do. Um, we give them a piece of chalk and a blackboard and we, we expect them to teach our kids how to read and write and do arithmetic um, and socialize them and teach them manners and teach them respect and all those things. Um, but we also ask them, to check kids' heads for lice, check their arms and legs for bruises, for mm -hmm. abuse, search lockers and ser search backpacks for contraband. And, and we don't pay them very much. Um, we don't pay our law enforcement officers very much. We don't pay our military members very much. The people that choose those professions, they are not doing them thinking they're going to get rich. They are not doing them 
uh, for, for monetary gain. They're doing them for other reasons, which is that service mentality. Like, what can I do right. that can help or benefit someone else? But then you get these guys to take the shortcuts. And I had mentioned to you before, I know, you know, five guys who went to biker gangs. And when I was talking about detective buddies, I said, that's the oddest thing because I know these guys. I work with these guys. I mean, I actually work with them for years in, in, a, in a warehouse. And uh, when I told him, I said, that guy, that guy was the biggest doofus, man. I mean, that guy was a dork. I mean, and then to switch over to become uh, involved in, in a group um, just blew my mind. But some people take shortcuts, right? And they're not giving back to society. Or maybe they feel that they're giving back to a society, but it's their society, their tribe. Uh, and maybe it's an easy way. I mean, for you, you, know you those people, right? they, they like, we want to belong to something. You're right. Absolutely. We, we want to be a part of something and we want to have that, that sense of family, of, of, of relevance. Um, it's, it's no different than how a street gang, uh, recruits a young kid. Yeah. You, you've got the power and influence of a street gang. And, and you've got respect and intimidation and money. And then you got some kid in the neighborhood who doesn't have a father at home, uh, is, is afraid, is fearful, doesn't have food to eat. And then they're approached by some gang who says, hey, man, you come with us. Like, you wear our colors. You join forces with us. And you're going to have money. You're going to have power. You're going to have influence. People are going to be intimidated by you when you don't have any of those things. And that opportunity is presented to you. Man, that, 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 that probably sounds pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can see where they'd ha they, they joined because of that, but for you, I mean, and I'm not saying you ever had the urge to cross the line, but you know, people look at easy money, man. They get in law enforcement and they say, hey, there's there's money there to be made. You know, there's there's esteem to be had. There's privilege here, you know. Um, it's it's almost, I wouldn't say an easy life because there are consequences. Uh, people get into a line of work and then they look at the other side and say, well, maybe I'm in the wrong business. I mean, you know. Well, if you join uh, the military, if you join law enforcement and if you join it uh, for the for the monetary, the, the compensation element of it, man, you're making the, yeah. the, the wrong decision. Um, one thing in, in, in law enforcement, and we, and it's, and it's, we see it more today than ever before is that you don't have to hunt violence as a cop. Violence is hunting you. Um, it's, it's coming for you. Um, and so, you know, every morning, uh, law men and women, uh, their alarm clock goes off and they put their feet on the ground and they pour their kids some cereal and they have a cup of coffee with their wife or their husband. And then they leave their families with no guarantee they ever get to come back and see them again to defend and protect other families so that they can see their loved ones. again. And they do it. Uh, they, they volunteer into that. They, 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 they do it for the right reasons and the the truth of the matter is is that there's that we we said it right from the beginning of of our discussion there's violence out there uh there's evil people out there um as a lawman uh or woman um you have to be prepared to have violence brought on you and then you have to be prepared to use an equal or greater amount of violence to contain that situation. Yeah. And, and if you can't do that, if you can't mentally be prepared for that, man, today's a good day to find another line of work. Yeah, for sure. Well, now you're an inspiration to a lot of people. And I know that you don't think that, you know, you, you were the, the, the top dog, but you've done so much. I mean, I know you're doing film and television. You've written a book, uh, you know, the one with uh, Gerard Butler, right? Den of Thieves that came out. I watched it, loved that movie that came out a couple of years ago, man. I mean, you're able to take basically your career and your life story and help infuse that into the culture of today and get people to see things differently than they would have because you're on, you're out there getting work done. So now we are aware that there is a subculture out there that's doing these things, but you've exposed um, you know, the, this, the subculture of gun runners and uh, murderers and thieves and 
uh, bikers. It's been a privilege, but how do you feel? I mean, are you paid to go on the documentaries like the History Channel? And has it changed you in any way? Some people get big heads, real big heads. And you said you had to be humbled in some way. But for some people, they like this kind of mini fame. Has it changed you in any way? Um, I, you know what? I think, it, well, I don't think. I know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've, I've had my ass kicked too many times to, to have uh, an ego about any of this. Um, there's, there's things that I accomplished that drew attention that drew praise, but, but like, like I know behind the scenes, I know the backstory and I know that it it wasn't perfect and it wasn't as beautiful as sometimes it's portrayed in, in the documentaries and the television shows and in books and all those things. So what I try to do, like in our discussion this morning, which, which keeps that balance is I just try to be transparent about it. I try to be honest about it. If, if all I did was sit here and tell you hero stories and I love me stories, that would be counterfeit. Um, and, and then everything else I say would be drawn under question because they're like, man, like, th- like this dude ain't coming clean. He's not telling the truth. He's only telling the good side of his story. Well, there's a bad side to it too. So what, what part is that? I mean, you know, what's your biggest weakness then? You know, some people have, uh, Emotional myopia, man. They just do not know how to regulate uh, themselves and they don't know how to interact with other people and they never really get to know who they are. I mean, do you have a big weakness? I, I, I think my my weakness, which mm-hmm. I'm like working really hard to try to overcome, is that um, when I look back on my career and, and people say flattering things, and they and they find things elements of that career that they admire like i i I can't do it like when i look back on my career the things that pop into my head first are the mistakes and the failures and the and the humiliations and the embarrassments and the regrets um it's like i really struggle to to find uh, or to, to, to find the things that, that, that other people find praise in yeah. uh, the, 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 the mistakes are, man, they're like right at the forefront of my brain, the good stuff, the successes are packed way back there somewhere. And like, there's, it, it's at the point where like, I can't hardly even access those anymore. Yeah. You got uh, guys with those. I love me walls, man. They've got those decorations and awards, and uh, that seems to make up for everything, but I, I don't think so. Um, Mike, I'll tell you what, man, and that was a, that's a great point, and, and I'm just going to use myself as a personal example. Mm-hmm. Um, behind me, like, I have pictures of my family. Yeah. That's, that, that, that's, that, that's what I have in my office. I've, I've learned that that is what is important, and that is what um, I should be honoring. Um, I had literally truckloads of awards and plaques and trophies from my professional career. All of them are in the landfill. They're meaningless. This is what's important. All all the certificates and the, all that stuff in the, in the grand scheme of things that, that doesn't matter, man. This is what matters. Yeah, legacy. I mean, and I think our purpose shifts many times over a lifetime, and we reinvent ourselves many times. But at the end of the day, you you have your your idea of what, what what's best for you and how you tell others, right? I mean, I I chased for years what I thought was going to be my legacy, how I wanted to be remembered, uh, the things I wanted to be accomplished. In the end, when my eyes were truly open to it. Like there, there was no legacy. You leave, you leave this job and, and you're forgotten. You know, it, like uh, ATF has like airbrushed me out of the yearbook. It's like I was never there. Hmm. Are you embittered in any way? I mean, we, we see this in 
common culture in books and movies that uh, here's a guy, you know, they didn't get that serial killer. They didn't put that guy away. Uh, do you have peace in your heart? I do. Largely? I, and, and I was um, I was angry for a long time. Okay. And I was bitter for a long time. Um, and then, like, at, at one point, the light bulb went off, and I'm like, man, who, like, who is truly being hurt by your attitude, Jay? Who's being hurt by your anger? Who's being hurt by your bitterness? It was me. But where did that come from? Was that a light bulb that went off like in therapy or was it a process over a period of a year where you began to say, well, you know, I have an inkling that maybe I'm angry and I'm hurting people. Or is it you're sitting on a sofa with a therapist and saying, man, what a jerk. I got to fix this. You know? There was a, a point in time where I felt like, like, man, where's my parade? Yeah. <laughs> I did things that have never been done before. I wanted to be, uh, Maverick and I wanted to land my jet on the aircraft carrier and I wanted the flight crew to like lift me on their shoulders and play the Star Spangled Banner and have fireworks going off. I felt like I deserved that. That man, that was wrong. I didn't deserve that. Um, I hadn't earned that. That's a, that, that was a movie, right? That's, that wasn't real life. Yeah. And so, like we said earlier, you know, these threats start coming in and I can't get any help and I can't get support. And then my house burns down and then they try to frame me as the as the arsonist and and, and all that uh, times they double down on me like, I man, I was pissed. I was angry. I was like, man, I don't deserve this. Why me? Of all people, like I gave you my life. I spilled blood for you. Of all people, why would you not have my back? And then I, I realized, at least like in government work, the machine is too big to care about the individual. If the machine stopped to care about Jay Dobbins or what was going on in my life, everything else would come apart. The, the, the machine of government is like a steamroller and it yeah. is going to move forward. And it's your job to get out of the way. And if you don't get out of the way and let it move past you, you're going to get ground into the asphalt and just mushed and smashed. And so step aside. I wasn't smart enough to step aside. I got run over. I got run over <laughs> by the Hells Angels. Yeah. You know, the Hells Angels ran me over. I spent two years of my life infiltrating that gang. D do they care? Like, did I have any impact on them? They're bigger and stronger and faster and nastier than they ever were. Like I was nothing more than a speed bump in the history of the Hells Angels. And they ran right over the top of me. The government ran right over the top of me. It, like at some point you got to be smart enough, Jay, Hey, you know what? Step out from the side of the steamroller because you're going to get mushed. That's good that you can reflect that you can look back you know, with this uh, introspective attitude and, and, and realized uh, some of the problems and actually get some successes out of it, you know, uh, and, and put some things to rest. So let's talk about um, two things, um, the future projects that you're working on. And also what's important to me is telling our listeners, our viewers, um, life lessons, man. I mean, what, what are your one, two, three top things or just one thing that people can use to navigate through life, you know, which is to have a sense of humor or it's to not be a victim. What, what, what is your advice to anyone who may be struggling in anything that they're doing? That's pretty darn hard. Well, you know, for me, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, it's just, it, it's God. I let God mm -hmm. in my life and I let God uh, uh, control the direction of my life. Th there's times when I still resist it. I can feel myself being pulled some direction and I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't understand what he's trying to do in my life. I, f I fight against it. Um, I always lose those fights. Thankfully, I lose those fights and he uh, finds the right path for me. Um, but when I finally accepted um, and then embraced that, like, like I wasn't controlling my life. Like that, that higher power of my faith was controlling my life, man. Things mm. got much simpler and, and my life got much more peaceful and I became much happier. Um, but we, but we sometimes get put on paths that we don't understand yeah. and that we don't, um, 
they, they, they don't always make sense to us in real time. But if you have faith um, and, 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 and follow your heart and, and try to do the right thing, things work out not necessarily the way we want them to. They work out the way they're supposed to. Yeah, agreed. I do. And future plans, man. I mean, um, you, you don't seem like a guy who just sits around watching Netflix all day. You, you seem like you're involved in a lot of projects. What, what are your projects right now? What are your plans? Uh, any type of bucket list, you know, creatively? Um, things you want to do like painting or self-expression? Uh, you know what? Like I live a pretty uh, simple life. Mm -hmm. um, like, like I'm content. Um, I, I coach. I coach high school football. Okay. I get a lot of satisfaction out of that, out around, you know, um, uh, the enthusiasm of young people is contagious. Yeah, it is. And, and that's good for me. Um, I'm an adjunct uh, professor at the University of Arizona. I teach a class there. And so like going on campus mm -hmm. and being around young people or, or going to football practice and being around young people that man, that's, that, that's great therapy for me. Um, and, and, and I had those people in my life uh, when I was a kid who, who guided me and helped me. Um, I play a little golf. I'm terrible. Uh, I'm a terrible golfer, man. You know, and, and when I was a kid, when I was young, like I had success as an athlete. And, and golf will definitely uh, challenge. If you think you're an athlete, golf will definitely call all that into question. You're just trying to hit a little ball and it's sitting right in front of you and it's standing still. Um, and so, but I enjoy the process of trying to get better at that. I'm, I'm never going to be, I'll never be great. I probably will never be good. Right. Uh, but, but the, 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 the process in that is, is fun for me. Good, man. So any film projects coming up? Any new documentaries that we haven't heard? Of? I know A and E came out with something just a couple of weeks ago, but what do you have in the pipeline? There, there's always something popping. Um, uh -huh. You know, like A and E has a couple shows uh, now that 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 I was asked to participate in. There's a show about the Hell's Angels, the the uh, secrets of the Hell's Angels that's uh -huh. on A and E. Um, there's another show on A and E. Um, it's called Undercover Caught on Tape, and there's a couple. Uh, cases that are featured there that are outside the hell's angels world that i worked on that i that i felt like were important cases um and you know like like with hollywood um and the entertainment world hollywood is a club and i'm not a member um like like when they when they call um if i have something to bring to the table I try to offer that, but like that, that, that's, that, that there's, that, there's a club there in Hollywood. And like I said, like, like I'm not part of the club, Yeah. but people think that like, like, you know, like you, you hear like the criticisms, like, like, why is he still telling this story 20 years later? Like, I don't, I don't call networks and say, Hey, will you like feature me in an episode of your show? I don't, I don't call people and say, Hey, can I be on your podcast? Like if people come to me and if they're interested in my story or what I have to say, I try to be accommodating. I agree with you. Hollywood is a club. I know a couple of people, uh, they're, uh, small timers, but you know, it, 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 you have to have an attitude. And I say they're managed mouthpieces, man. You're controlled by the studios and they tell you what to say. And so in a sense, I mean, even the rock, you know, Dwayne Johnson, you know, he's coming out now, but, uh, and he has a lot of fame, but at the same time, what, what good are you using it for? Are you steering youth in the right direction? Are you speaking your mind or are you worried about what you look to the public, you know, the public eye? But for you, I see it as this is something uh, more important than The Rock will ever do. And that's not movies. It's, it's not filmed them. It is talking about joining, you know, uh, a brotherhood of law enforcement officers and doing undercover work and the stresses that go with that. And this is impactful to society and will be for a long time. So um, you are in the history books, whether you like it or not, you are. And people are going to examine this and they're going to re-examine this. So I don't think there's anything wrong about talking about it for 20 years. It, it, there would be a problem if you were a glory hound and you wanted to do it to wax your ego, but you're not. 
This is something that we're going to examine the history books for a long, long time. I, I think that for any of us, um, what platform are you provided? And then yeah. what do you do with that platform? Um, if, if, if you're only going to serve yourself, um, it, you may enjoy it for a while, but it's not going to last forever. Like, can you use your platform, whatever it is, to try to help other people, to try to inspire other people, um, to try to improve somebody else's life? Um, and if you can do that, in turn, you improve your own life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Jay, we're, we're coming to a close now. Is there any question I didn't ask? I didn't want to get into the idea of the gangs and uh, the history there because it's been done before. So many people have talked about it. But I wanted to get into the idea of fighting monsters, and the idea of the own internal struggles, the own uh, conflicts and the resolution. So that was my goal today. But is there anything I didn't ask, anything you want to share? I, th I just think that for, for all of us, you know, in these professions, especially the, the, the people that are that are in your audience, um, men like go out and and change the world, put your dent in the universe, go be amazing. And then in the process, you know, like love your God, love your family, love your friends, uh, love your peers. But the, the most important thing is that you have to learn to love yourself. You have to learn to take care of yourself. Um, and, and people in the professions that, that, that we're speaking to, they're always taking care of somebody else. They're always serving someone else. And then we forget about ourselves and, 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 and we get beat up for it. So try not to do that. Try to, try to love yourself along the way as well. I appreciate those wise words, man. So Jay, uh, thanks for coming on, man. I really, truly happy that you came on and actually talk about um, your personal life and not so much uh, your work, but your personal life. I was very happy to not get into the mechanics of an investigation and talk like about uh, bigger picture issues that I, that I think are much more important. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Well, don't go anywhere. Uh, we'll, we'll just chat offline for a little bit, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Please like share, subscribe, check out Jay, man. Uh, if you don't know about him, I mean, go go on Wikipedia. If not, go on the History Channel or A&E and look it up and, and see what's going on. But uh, great job doing some difficult work and uh, uh, very inspiring, at least to me and I'm sure to many people. But uh, check him out. So thanks for coming on, Jay. And we'll Thank talk to you for you having soon. Me. Absolutely.